Uh, this is going to be perhaps the shortest sermon you've ever had. Fellowship, that, that goes right in with the message. Um, I did want to extend a very big thank you to two people who are not here in this room right now, but maybe we can all collectively pass this on uh, personally, but Graham and Jenny organised the day, so uh, all those things do not go unnoticed. So. Please, uh, you know, within the fellowship, just yes. give them a big hug and say thank you for all the effort you put in. A um, bit of a review. We have been looking at a series on love and understanding uh, what uh, all that we have to learn. And there's much to learn about how to love and about Christ's love. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we looked at uh, the first title was It's All About the Lover. And that was a passage about the demon-possessed man. In Mark 5, and how Jesus saw his heart and uh, saw beyond the, uh, the exterior, the complications that was going on in this particular demon-possessed man's life. And Jesus loved him. He saw something beyond, you know, whatever everyone else was turned away by. And that's a real challenge because uh, that's how God loves us. He sees beyond our... Uh, convoluted at times or complicated um, lives and sees a heart and that's what God loves and that's what changes us that's where we start at. it's all about the lover Miles on week two talked about love matters most and, and we all remember different things from different messages um, though I think Brian Simmons did talk last week about how's our memory and about yeah. memory things yeah, right? yeah, yeah so yeah. I had to look back on my notes, uh, but I remember Miles, one particular example he talked about was how love is spelt T-I-M-E, yeah, um, right. if you remember that one, which yeah. was a, you know, kind of very simple but yeah. very powerful uh, message that it's about uh, us spending time and, um, and how that makes a world of difference when we do that because we can say we love each other but we're not actually going to put the time in, then um, what, yeah. how deep is that love? Uh, Dave Tebbett uh, spoke about loving like Christ loves me. And once again, we all take different things out of different messages. Uh, he, he shared about the greatest commandments, to love God of all your hearts and mind and strength. And the second is this. And he shared about that great conjunction, the and. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And there was a, a powerful message there about how uh, our, our time with God, our quiet time, if you like, uh, extends beyond just the scriptures. It is about how we, um, how we love others, and, and that was that point. Brian preached an absolute cracker last week, um, those that were here, about forgiveness. And that, the title of that was Love Let's It Go. A um, couple of points, I remember this one the most out of all of them, because it's the freshest, uh, most recent, but also very, very uh, poignant. Um, and he, there was five points, but there were three, three of those points. One was the, sin, the, the, the uh, forgiveness is the centrality of his Christ. And uh, shared about how ultimately that, that Jesus on the cross, God forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Stephen then replicated almost those same words. If you remember when he was uh, having rocks thrown at him. Have to be careful because I, 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 um, being a chaplain of the school, if I, I, I shared about... Paul being stoned, and I had to, uh, <laughs> I had to uh, explain what that meant exactly. So notice it's rocks thrown at him. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't yeah. stoned. Uh, so yeah. um, it is a ball school. Um, so, but you know, once again, that same love that, that Jesus has, uh, you know, poured out on us and, and on Stephen in that case, exactly what was replicated that same sense of love and that passage in Matthew 5 which says love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven so it's that Christ like love Brian talked about what forgiveness is not and he also talked about what forgiveness is and uh, a couple of points from that I remember is that um, uh, forgiveness is about well, about letting go um, it's related to judgment what he talked about um, how we you know none of us really like that term judgment. I'm going to refer to it a little bit today, but uh, there is always a consequence for our actions. That's the fact, and we all are deserving of uh, a consequence for our our actions. And ultimately, that separation from God. But that's where the significance of forgiveness comes in. 
He talked about how forgiveness is expensive. It's about cancelling someone's debt. It's not about forgetting the debt. <laughs> the debt still exists. Someone gets a, a, a speeding fine, someone has to pay, right? You could, you could plead, please let me off, but no, that fine exists. Or if a, I think Brian used the example of a, a, a car crash. You know, there, there's still going to be a debt to pay. Yeah. Um, the, the forgiveness part is when someone takes that, that, that expense. And therefore, it is expensive. It can be a real challenge. In fact, a very, very significant challenge. So for us to be forgiving like Christ is an incredible... It's, it, it costs us. Yeah. It costs us to forgive others. Yeah. And that's, that was a very powerful um, point. Uh, forgiveness means, according to what Brian shared, is that, that we're no longer enslaved by someone's wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And we find us that, that we are dragged down by the wrongdoing of others. Then we, we maybe we challenge ourselves, I think was the point, to, to ask ourselves, have we forgiven? Because when we forgive, we're no longer enslaved, I think was a powerful point. And then Brian talked about some practicals to end with, um, taking uh, the passage from Romans 12, bless those who persecute you. Wow, that's a challenging thing. Uh, to pr actually pray for them, that's a practical, to have the attitude to, to, uh, to bless them. Um, yeah. Brian also talked about following God's righteous judgment, so uh, considering Christ's attitude towards us and others, and then um, act in the interest of what's best for them. So this is all, I take notes on my phone, so there we go. Today we're going to look at, as I said, a very brief message, but it's about one another, because what lies at the heart of our love, particularly the way um, our love is expressed, our, our Christ-like love is how we love one another. And I believe it defines who we are as Christians by the way we love one another. And is also perhaps the most powerful light that we can shine in guiding others to Christ. So the key verse there is John chapter 13. I think we all know it well. John 13, 34 and 35. If you are there, it reads, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another and by this... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing. We, 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 can, we can even twist that in some way. But I, I think there's a very powerful message there about us loving one another. And one another, it refers to an attitude. An attitude that fosters lasting relationships. And is, in many ways, God's way of empowering us to build deep, long-lasting relationships with each other. And it is a term which is mentioned some 100 times in the Scriptures, and in fact about 59 times, in fact, I think it's exactly 59 times, depending on which version, in the New Testament alone. So all the passages related to love one another are obviously this one. Passages like Romans 12, there's a whole lot of uh, passages there, or verses there, which talk about being devoted to one another, honouring one another, live in harmony with one another, accept one another. So that one another is, is, is a, a, you know, a very significant term which is the kind of relationship and it's the attitude that we have within a relationship that is a Christ-like attitude. One another is a reciprocal term that invites us to engage in the interests of others. One another is not about ourselves. Obviously, it's about the other. One another is not as much about sharing common interests as much about being interested in sharing with those who perhaps aren't as common as us. Passage in Matthew 25, we know the verse, it's a, it's a judgment style verse, the sheep and the goats. Um, so uh, you don't have to turn there, but Matthew 25 where it talks about the king who went out um, and, and who noticed a, a, effectively a passage that, that highlights how God sees sees us as his children, and he saw the righteous, or saw the sheep in this sense, feeding the hungry, the poor, the needy, visiting those in jail, clothing those who uh, were naked, and so on. And then he says, we know the words, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. The one another attitude is one where you are actively looking for what is going to be the best interest of others. And we can see how close this is to God's heart, just in those three words. Whatever you did to one of these, you did for me. There's a direct, like a, a vein to God's heart there. 
So even our motivation, perhaps our reasoning, perhaps our inspiration for why should I be interested in someone else? They're not interested in me. We have the wrong mindset. The attitude is one of like, this is this is Christ-like mindset. You know, so our motivation is ultimately coming from, well, this is how Christ loves me. He takes he he invests in my interests. He wants us to invest in others with that same attitude. With another one, another one, sorry, with a one another mindset, there is that recognizable effort to embrace in others' interests. And it certainly makes when we have that attitude amongst each other here a very, very happy place to be. Because we are interested in one another's well-being. Um, I've been, one, one, of, one of the my responsibilities in my new role is uh, with the Tongan group. There, there is a direct connection between uh, the school I'm at and Tonga. Uh, historically, and my wife's heard this many times, I do apologise. Um, Tonga, uh, the very first missionary to Tonga 150 years, 153 years ago, was the first ever principal of this school. So you can imagine going to this island in the South Pacific, you know, uh, of people that perhaps had never seen, maybe they hadn't seen a white man, but maybe they had, a, you know. Um, anyway, this this is the inspiration of this particular um, reverend at the time, and and the church to to go and take the gospel, which is radical. 153 years ago, he wasn't married, so the church at the time decided that he would, uh, he should stay and get married, so he wouldn't be corrupted. So he did, and then he he became in that time he needed a job. He became the first headmaster of the school uh, here in Sydney of about 19 students. So all those great private schools always start very humble and very small. Uh, he was married, and then he, he shifted to Tonga for the next 47 years with his wife, had kids there. And part of what he did is he started up a school. So there's there's the connection. So when the principal, the head of my school, my boss, turns up there, there's no need for a visa. They'll meet him at the plane and I'll just escort him straight out because he's like royalty. You know, the, the country is, has got, you know, so much of its identity uh, through through this connection. So that's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so what, what they have is this this um, connection. So uh, every year they, they people will go over to Tonga and they uh, they they play rugby and sing all the things that Tongans like to do yeah. and eat yeah. and have church services. Yeah. They're, they're the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when they have church services, it lasts for a day. Um, anyway, so so we have borders from Tonga and, and we have quite a few Tongan students and about four of them are on the in the first 15 rugby team surprise surprise and they are big units um, and they, they are very very spiritually minded so part of my responsibility is to have a prayer group with them on a Thursday night and they call it polotu which is it's a Polynesian word for a gathering a sacred gathering so we, we do that and so what I do I, I have a Bible study with them and we pray. It's a, it's a really, it's quite a surreal experience. And what happened a couple of weeks ago is that one of the um, kind of the brother, the brother of the principal of this Tupac College passed away, and his son was an old boy at the school. So it's a very significant thing within the community when someone passes away. And and I thought, oh, you know, let's write a card, you know, we'll have the guy sign it, we'll send it back to them, and so on. And that seemed to be like a good thing to do, you know. But then I, you know, asked around and f figured out that that's not necessarily culturally the best thing to do. And this is where you start to think one another is about considering what's best for someone else, not necessarily, you know, for yourself or what you think. So, so anyway, so we, so what we did is I, the, the the actual um, group wanted to have a. Uh, but they, they prayed, and we had a, we had our, our group devoted to paying tribute to this particular person, um, and we did that. But we didn't we didn't um, we didn't do what I thought would have been the thing to do, because apparently back in Tonga they would have this extended period of mourning, and um, and they actually would have a they they uh, have a tent outside the house of the deceased, and they would 
be there and mourn and wail and sing and eat, and, you know, for an extended period of time. So, so to kind of like jump the gun on it would be inappropriate. So I'm learning a lot about how to respect others um, and, and what, what's best for others, not, not what I think. Um, anyway, long and short of it is that there, there is a 150 year anniversary of this uh, Tupo College in two weeks time. And um, fortunately last week they knocked on my door or the school didn't said, we want you to go. Mm. So all of a sudden, you know, I'm new on this job and they're like, okay, you're going to Tonga. So I'm going to Tonga, that's it. Um, so I thought I better, I, better, I better understand a little bit more about the culture yeah. because once again, you can go to a place and think, oh, I've been to islands before, I've been to New Guinea, I've been to Fiji, you know, but Tonga's a completely different place. Different people, different customs, different interests, what's best for them? So I started to look, I looked through a whole lot of different sources and I've got lots and lots of more reading to do to understand and apparently Part of their church services, which is an interesting uh, focus, is they um, they don't have a set sermon. They have a, lots and lots of singing, but you just stand up and preach. It's an open platform, so you think it's funny. It's a, the, the boss said to me, you better have a sermon ready, right? So that's what it's going to be, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's, just, it's like, you know, we're all here and we're singing and, and, and Xavier stands up and says, I've got, I've got a message, you know, that's, that's what it's like, so. Anyway, so it'll be a little bit more prepared, prepared. Uh, anyway, you know, there, there's, there's a deeply, you know, as I said, very spiritual, very Christian-minded place. Um, and I and I learned about their, their royalty, because they are, they have a monarchy there, so they have a king, and, and they had a queen. And the queen, uh, his name was uh, Salotti Tupu III. And um, during the 1953 coronation of Queen Elizabeth, that's going back before my time, uh, but some of you may, well, she's in 1953. Um, she's now over 90 years old, isn't she? She's 90 years old, Queen. Uh, Salotti was there. So the way it was uh, there in London is they had, you know, the royal possession of all of the kings and queens of the world. And they're in their carriages and you know they're all uh, traveling behind the queen and so on this is the research i've done anyway queen salotti's there and um and it rained in like probably like today <laughs> on the day of the coronation and uh so to protect the kings and queens they they put a hood over their carriage and uh but one carriage did not have a hood over it you know whose that was oh. i think I'm, i've given you the name already oh. salotti oh because she considered, this is an interesting, and it's all written up, this is what I did the research. Um, uh, she considered that if the people could get wet in, the, in honor of England's queen, then so could she. Wow. And you think, it's kind of a, you know, it's a small thing to do, but it was very, very significant. In fact, the world took notice mm. because she considered them. So that's as much as she's there honoring the queen, and so were all the other people, she's thinking, well, you know, it's about what's, you know, considering others, not herself. So she got wet, but she certainly earned the, the uh, you know, the, the attention, or gained the attention of, of, of the world. And apparently it goes on that the Queen, when she visited Tonga, returned that favour somehow, mm -hmm. where she did something that was, you know, unroyal, mm. <laughs> but it was about honouring the people. So, what another mindset. Um, I don't know how I got to that, but anyway, the other, the other thing is this past week, and this is uh, once again, you know, something which may or may not be of significance, but um, it was Reconciliation Week. Uh, something that maybe, you know, we, we, if we haven't been directly involved, then what's the big deal? That kind of a thing. And Reconciliation Week uh, is if, if, in many ways to honour the, the first peoples of Australia. So we're talking about Indigenous Australia. And it's a time set aside to reflect as a nation um, on our desire to be inclusive and to have, uh, and to have equal relationships um, that, uh, and particularly to honour the First Peoples. And once again, if we haven't had any concern with it, we kind of think, that's good, it's, I'm sure it's helpful, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the question is, you know, what, what about us? What, what can we learn from this whole attitude of, of, of reconciliation? And 
I believe that in many ways that reconciliation does light the heart of a one another mindset. All right? It is about considering others. And something I gained from hearing some uh, reflection on this whole reconciliation week um, was that the idea, because if, if you think about it, back in the, in the day when, when uh, the, the whole white Australia policy was one of, uh, 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 sorry, the, um, the one where the, that, um, the white, white Australian people took the children of the indigenous people, stolen you know, the generation. Stolen generation. Um, it was, the mindset was, we're going to give them the best life possible. That was the mindset, and we all understand that. And therefore, it's like, oh, well, that seems okay. Yeah, what's the big deal? You know, well, obviously, the big deal was that you know children were taken from their parents. Mm -hmm. And when you obviously look at it like that, you think, well, oh, that's terrible. Yeah. You know, so sometimes this is what I get out of it. Sometimes what we think is best for others is not necessarily what's best. That's very challenging. Yeah. What we think is best for others is not necessarily treating others in the best way that, that, that is best. <laughs> so that's, that's what reconciliation is, considering what is best for others. That Matthew 25 verse, back to that, you know, we're talking about this attitude of Christ. The flip side of it is when it talks about the goats. This is the judgment side. <laughs> we... we, we you know, a vein directly to God's heart is one where it does, you know, we do consider what's best for others. The flip side of it is, in verse 25, oh, sorry, 45, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did not, sorry, whatever you did not do for the least one of these, you did not do for me. You know, that makes me feel awfully uncomfortable, you know, when, when God is looking at what we don't do. We don't like to think about what we don't do. <laughs> but I think it is concerns God. And even, you know, when we think about, um, you know, it, it, honouring God with one another relationships is about what we do do when we consider others. And it is about us being motivated by having a Christ-like mindset. The final verse we'll look at is in Philippians chapter 2. Pick it up in verse 1. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, of any comfort from his love, of any, if any common sharing in the spirit, of any tenderness and compassion, that make my joy complete, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of one another. In your relationship with one another, have the same attitude of mind, uh, same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to, something used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being being made in human likeness, and being found in his appearance as a human being, being humbled, be, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the names above every name that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess and every, and, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One another mindset, as we can see in that verse, is one where um, we are called to have a Christ-like attitude. He took the very nature of a servant, I think is key to that verse. A servant's commitment, of course, is to care for the needs of those that they serve. Yeah. Despite Jesus being in that nature of God, he didn't choose to see himself in any other way. When we have relationships with others, is, is we, we are too important within that relationship rather than thinking it's about the other person. That's the person I'm serving. That's the person that I'm connecting with. Yeah. Jesus chose to serve the people with one, one another mindset. Of course, we know he fed the hungry, washed their feet. Uh, loved the unlovable. But he did this practically by focusing on what is their interests because he's there to serve them. And that's how God is with us. That's the mindset that God is imploring us to also <laughs> consider and to adopt. So ask yourselves, even within the fellowship here, 
how are we going with that one another mindset? It's an attitude. How do we connect with each other? Uh, perhaps going on from the, relate, uh, from the message that Brian shared last week about forgiveness. Maybe there's the need for that, the need for resolve so we can connect. Maybe it's along the lines of what, uh, the message that Miles shared about you know, needing to spend that time with each other. Whatever it takes to have a one another mindset. But I believe it's time for us as a church to be a model of love to the world. Not because we want to be some elitist better than others. But because we're inspired by Christ's love and compelled to be Christ-like in our relationships. And we can start by loving one another. Now we're going to take up uh, communion at this time. And Raj, after this, is going to uh, share a couple of thoughts from India um, for our collection tour. What lies at the heart of communion is community. The, 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 the root of the word. It's about us being together. We're here to share the time where we can reflect on uh, Jesus and his inspiration for us and his love for us. Um, Acts chapter 2, we know they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking bread and to prayer. We are devoted in that same sense to remembering Jesus at this time. I looked up all the verses in the Bible that talked about taking, taking the bread together. And of course that's one of them. But um, it did talk about in Acts 20 how Paul, when he was in Troas, they had communion on the first day of the week. And that uh, came after the Jewish festival of unleavened bread. But they were there uh, to um, break the bread at that time. But I believe that, that the heart of taking communion is about us being together to share in Christ's love. So let's just bow our heads at this time as we take that communion. <clears throat> Lord Almighty God, we thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, we, we do pray uh, for our community, God, that, that we can bond, that we can have a Christ-like attitude, Father. We pray, Lord, that we can just always be inspired by your love for us, God. We thank you, Lord, that um, you see beyond uh, whatever um, we, we don't see in ourselves and whatever we don't see in others, Father. You see our hearts, Father, and you love us deeply, God. We pray that we can have the same attitude, Lord, to, to love like you, Father, and and to know, God, that your love is, uh, has no bounds, Father. We thank you that uh, Jesus died for this very purpose, Lord, that, uh, Lord, uh, that we would no longer be separated, Father, that, we would, that, that you would abolish um, any uh, sin that, that would separate us from you, God. We thank you for that. We thank you that we can take this bread and this wine at this time to remember that. And it's in Jesus' name we give thanks. Amen. Just as we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Thank you.